Oh, I'm Howard George. I am very disappointed to be introducing Shelley Glashow. Uh, it's, it's of, of course an honor to introduce Shelley at any time, but this time I'm introducing Shelley because John Iliopoulos hasn't arrived yet, and it would have been much more fun uh, for you and for me to hear John, but we're, we're stuck with me. So I, I've known Shelley for about 38 years, though he doesn't remember the first time we met when I was a third-year undergraduate and I screwed up my courage to go to his office and ask to take an independent study course in particle physics. He agreed immediately. Shelley doesn't care about that sort of thing. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the course never happened because some dean uh, decided that I had not satisfied a distribution requirement and I was forced to take a course in abnormal psychology instead. <laughs> Anyway, there was no harm done. I, I returned to Harvard a few years later and had the fun of doing a lot of physics with Shelley in subsequent years. And fun is certainly the word that characterizes his physics, from his Nobel Prize winning work on what we now call the standard electroweak model, through charm to grand unification. There's a mischievous playfulness about Shelley's physics that sets him apart from all the other great physicists I've known, except perhaps Sidney Coleman. Uh, Shelley is the Higgins Professor of Physics Emeritus at Harvard. Uh, really, of course, Shelley's less emeritus than anyone I can think of. He simply retired to Boston University, where he is the University Professor and Arthur G. Metcalf Professor of Physics. So let's welcome him back to Harvard. Thanks, Howard. It's great to be back, even briefly. Uh, it's also nice to have the last word today. Uh, I'm amazed that this program is still on time in view of the profound error made by the first speaker, David. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, David uh, explained the, uh, the, the uh, Kavli curve by which one determines the optimal length of a speech, but, but he, he neglected uh, uh, to bring into account Einstein's theory of relativity as applied to rhetoric, <laughs> which is that time passes more slowly to the speaker. <laughs> uh, it's very logical to follow Murray, uh, because it, of course it was Murray uh, who brought me to Caltech. I think he thought I was an East German at some point. <laughs> Uh, and he brought me to Caltech at the same time that Sidney was uh, his graduate student. Uh, uh, Sidney then was suffering under the silly sobriquet that Murray uh, and Fred Zachariasen invented. He was called Squid. Not you? That was Fred. Uh, we became friends quite quickly. We were both interested in science fiction. He a bit more professionally than, than I. Uh, and uh, we managed to escape Pasadena's smog by climbing Mount Wilson uh, more or less every week. We found 36 routes up Mount Wilson. Uh, and then Murray came out with the Eightfold Way, unitary symmetry. And uh, most people didn't believe it. They didn't like this crazy new mathematics, Lie groups. Who ever heard of Lie groups? And why, how can you do things with eight by eight matrices? So he and I realized that you could kind of stop all the baryons into a three-by-three three matrix and do calculations that way. And as Murray described, uh, we were able to calculate magnetic moments uh, in this naive theory. They came out rather well. Uh, the sigma plus, just to remind you, uh, naive SU3 gave the sigma plus magnetic moment right to 10%. The lambda moment right to 30%. The sigma-lambda transition, we now know, it hit right on to within a few percent. So it was really quite surprising, and we got convinced that the Eightfold Way was right. Uh, then we applied this work to baryon mass differences. We derived the so-called coleman glashow mass formula, which is correct today within errors. Amazing. And so what... That was pretty good for starters. So we... Uh, being convinced that Murray was right uh, in a, a vacuum in which very few other people were so convinced, we found a, our natural profession as uh, defenders of Murray's 
theory. As uh, disciples of Murray, we traveled uh, throughout the world, throughout the states. I have a list of some of the places we traveled. One of us, or both of us, or uh, whatever. Well, hundreds of different cities. I've lost my list. But Yeah, they got, well, uh, this is a strange paper. Uh, our most, uh, yeah, we, I'll come back to that. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the strange thing. Anyway, uh, we, I came back to, uh, I came to Harvard uh, in, I think it was the fall of uh, 63. Our president got uh, murdered at that time. Uh, but we wrote this rather weird paper on octet dominance that Murray alluded to. And, uh, well, the only aspect of that paper I'll describe is this. Sidney uh, was a little bit upset when the Physical Review rejected our paper because they didn't like our use of the word tadpoles. So Sidney said, that's no problem to the Physical Review. How about lollipop diagrams? Or maybe sperm cell diagrams? <laughs> the Physical Review relented and tadpoles were published. So we went all over the place uh, uh, telling people that Murray was right uh, to Orsay, Eritre, Tokyo, Copenhagen, CERN, Istanbul, Schladming, Warsaw, Budapest, and more. Uh, and however, all of these uh, proselytizing activities came to a natural and quite successful end when our friend Nick Samios and his uh, buddies discovered the omega minus particle that Murray had predicted. Incidentally, I should say that uh, Murray always firmly believed that these excited baryons belonged in a 10, uh, whereas Sidney and I, for whatever reason, put them into a 27. Yeah, that was not right. <laughs> now, in 64, Sidney and I went to our first Rochester meeting. It was in uh, Dubna, and we were to present the work that was done by Rob Sokolow and Howie Schnitzer and he and me about various electromagnetic mass splittings in the Eightfold Way. And uh, I'd like to tell two stories, anecdotes, if you will, of uh, what happened to us on this trip to Russia. Uh, one of the anecdotes has a name. Sidney called it my favorite moment uh, in the Soviet Union that was upon our arrival in Moscow. And the other story will concern our departure from the Soviet Union. I will skip uh, the story of the boat trip at Dubna. Uh, all of the uh, members of the conference went on this wonderful uh, trip down the river and uh, it went on and on forever and we all finally got back to the hotel late at night, very hungry and, and rather wet because it was raining and uh, one of our Soviet friends, Sidorov, who had wisely uh, stayed at the hotel, indicated that he had been terribly afraid that we had been sunk by a, Rus by a Chinese submarine. So, the first uh, uh, anecdote, we arrive in the Soviet Union in Moscow, Sydney and I, uh, with our baggage and with a few other physicists, and we're met uh, by the uh, organizing committee who has a bus that's going to take us to Dubna. Of course, we had to wait a few hours for other physicists to arrive so they could fill the bus. The bus, properly filled, went off on the lousy roads to uh, Dubna. Uh, the bus, you could hardly call it that, had no windows. So when the, Sydney loves to tell the story, when the bus would go over a pothole and bend this way, the rain would come in this side, then the rain would come in the other side, and we all got thoroughly wet. Uh, arrived at the hotel, a hundred physicists arriving at the hotel at the same time, all breaking through the line and trying to check in first. It was absolute chaos. And threading through the physicists were porters who were trying to take our bags uh, to our room. And Sydney. Uh, not wisely allowed the porter to take his bags. I defended my own bags, Sidney's bags he would see the next day or the day after. We finally got to our room, uh, two small rooms, one for Murray, the other for Sidney and me, a tiny bathroom. I used the toilet and it broke. <laughs> the bathroom was a very small bathroom. Uh, where the shower was directly over the sink, which was directly next to the, to the toilet, and there was a radiator with two pieces of toilet paper and a towel. <laughs> Sidney took a shower 
The water went all over, over his, himself, over his clothes, over the towel, over the toilet paper. <laughs> Eventually, we, we, we uh, got into our little beds. Uh, Sidney, although he had lost his baggage, had secreted a small bottle of cognac. We each had a shot of cognac. Uh, said good night. Good night, Sidney. Good night, Shelley. Sidney lies down in his bed. I lie down in my bed. My bed collapses. <laughs> that was Sidney's happiest moment in the Soviet Union. <laughs> now we get to leave the Soviet Union. We're going to Warsaw. Uh, we get through customs, through immigration. There we are in what is it called? The departure lounge, together with lots of other Poles going to uh, Poland. And uh, we see the plane. It's a, a lot airliner, Polish airliner. Looks good, except it's swarming with mechanics who are taking the engine apart. <laughs> we decided the plane would probably be delayed. Looked around for something to eat. Now, there was a little stand uh, where food was uh, served, uh, such as it is, pieces of chleb with uh, pieces of fat on top, except they had run out of these little sandwiches. There was nothing, nothing to eat nothing to drink, what we were to do. Well, Sidney and I uh, were pretty ingenious in those days. We found the door, but the door was, of course, sealed. At the other side of the door was a, this lady in a babushka with a sort of crude sweeping device who was cleaning the floor. So, of course, we pounded on the door. She looked up. She opened the door. We entered Russia illegally again. No visa other side of the boundary, we went up a flight of stairs. There was a big sign saying, a restaurant, uh, what's closed? Zakrit or Atkrit? I always forget. But it said restaurant closed. Of course, uh, Sydney had a special way of pronouncing restaurant. He would pronounce it pektoran, as it <laughs> looks in Russian. So we pounded on the door of the pektoran. And they opened the door looking at us, and we waved our first-class taloni, our coupons that in tourists forced us to buy at some outrageous rate, and uh, they let us in. We sat at the other table. One of the tables was filled with... We said, we were, who, who are you? They said, we said, Amerikanski delegatsi. Okay. <laughs> so we sat next to the Polsky delegatsi. Uh, these Poles were sitting around a table with a very dirty tablecloth and a whole big pile of, well, they're not boiled eggs, they're, they're burnt eggs that uh, Russians like. They're sort of black on one side. And they were eating burnt eggs and beer. We flash our taloni to the waiter. We get a brand new tablecloth. We get a bottle of champagne. We get the caviar. We have a wonderful time for an hour or two. Finally drunk, we decide it's time to go back to the departure lounge. So we leave all our taloni, the, wait, the waiter is very happy. Uh, we get, go out the door, we go down the stairs, and then we're on the wrong side of the sealed door. And we see everybody on the other side getting ready to board the plane. So we pound on the door. By this time, that little old lady is on the other side, sweeping up. She knows us, lets us in, and we get on the plane and live happily ever after. Uh, Sidney and I wrote about six collaborative papers during the years 1961 to 1964. Uh, in 65, actually, we thought we had something new to say about CP violation in the neutral K on sector. We wrote a paper. But T.D. Lee objected strenuously to this paper. T.D. said that everything we had done was wrong, and furthermore, that he had done it first. So we scrapped that paper, and we showed up at TD's summer office at CERN and uh, apologized to him and actually took out these number two pencils, or pencils, and broke them in front of him. And he accepted that gracefully uh, uh, as our apology. Well, that was it for the coleman glashow collaboration for about a third of a century, uh, except for the fact that I think Sidney probably played a quiet role in bringing me back to Harvard in 1966. 
Our friendship remained wholly intact, but our scientific interests had diverged quite a bit. His to more formal questions, such as you've heard about, uh, mine more to phenomenology. The only papers we wrote together, actually good ones uh, at Harvard, uh, had to do with high energy tests of Lorentz invariants, and they were written in the late 1990s. When I applied to Princeton Graduate School many years ago, uh, I was rejected, and uh, uh, I think it was Eugene Wigner who said that this man appears to know the language of physics, but not its substance. And so I went to Harvard. <laughs> and I think uh, that Wigner was right. Uh, I, I may know the language of physics, and I'm sometimes a bit more familiar with the details of phenomenology than Sidney is, but Sidney understands the subtleties of quantum mechanics and of quantum field theory far, far better than I, and I would say far better than most anyone I've ever met. Uh, I've enjoyed playing with Sydney, working with Sydney in so many ways, traveling together, working together. There are many other stories I could tell you, but some of them I dare not speak of in public. <laughs> On and off, for 45 years, we've had a tremendous amount of fun. I shall always treasure the memories of our many, many marvelous moments. Thank you. <laughs>